So uh, this is not a how to select the proper graphics cards and stuff to, to, to put together your own PC. This is, um, we're building an, an own uh, microcontroller based computer, something like the Arduino, it's, it's, it's this uh, for real. And um, we've, we've seen a lot of things like, you know, people, people do workshops um, soldering together Arduinos, but nobody ever really understands what all of the little components are. And uh, we designed this, this, uh, this computer that we call the AnyKey. Um, and we're going to go talk through it, how, how the design sort of, how this whole thing came about, how the design came about, and um, how all of these components um, it came to be, how they were selected, how everything fits together. Um, so the whole project came about, um, you know, you're supposed to always have a cat and a baby or something cute in, in your talks. Um, the project came about because a friend of ours had, uh, with the cat, had a, uh, had a baby which she called Zoe with two dots on the E. And the problem with that was that it's hard to, to actually type that letter on, on the keyboard. So uh, Matthias, for, for her birthday, built her a one key keyboard which prints exactly that one letter. Um, this is basically what that looks like and you can already see sort of the relationship to, this is the insides of the one key keyboard. Um, and this was really a keyboard, a, a USB human interface device but that only um, had a single, well actually it had a, it had a, a Easter egg karaoke uh, function that it would type the song lyrics line for line as well. But the main function was just the E. Uh, we, we thought this would be a nice uh, little development kit for people who like to play with, uh, with embedded hardware. Um, and we went, uh, we sort of cleaned up the design a little bit um, and had proper, proper PCBs manufactured um, and, and put together a really solid, in, in our mind, a uh, little development kit for, for this ARM processor that we're using. Um, which, if you care to play with something like this, tomorrow, maybe, maybe this afternoon, we are going to be doing workshops where you can try yourself uh, at SMD soldering and, and actually solder together um, your, your own little any key. Yeah, it's, it's, it's quite small, but uh, it's easier than you think. So it's possible to do it by hand. So these were the, this is, this is what we got back from China to the, uh, the, uh, um, is it, it's just like Arduino, it's better and better. Um, it's, it's not an Atmega processor, it's an, it's an ARM uh, Cortex-M3 processor. Um, and it's quite a good deal faster, it's a 32-bit uh, architecture. Um, it has uh, somewhat more peripheral, uses less electricity, has, um, has USB on board, a separate USB uh, uh, device. And the really nice thing about this particular chip is also that um, if it's not programmed, you don't actually need a programmer for it because the ROM contains a, a mass storage device driver. So once you've put this thing together and you plug it in, um, the AnyKey chip as a, as a USB device and you can just copy the firmware sort of programming interface, you can't brick it um, because the driver is, is in ROM and, and it just doesn't, you just need a compiler and copy the firmware over. That makes it really easy to work with. Um, it's a fairly popular architecture that we're using. If, if people were at the uh, CCC camp last year, or I've seen these, these, these rocket um, badges um, uh, use exactly the same processor. And they have quite a lot of peripherals on them, um, external displays, they had wireless, they have joysticks and stuff like that. Um, we're sort of reduced um, what the peripherals are, but we're thinking, you know, you can, these probably in series would be about 10 euros um, that you would just sort of put these into your own design. Some people are making something like a quadcopter or something to use them to, um, to just have a very, very small and light um, device. So basically we're saying, what, how, how did we come up with this processor to begin with? Um, um, do you want to? I don't, I don't care. You're the one who came up with it. Um, so. Yeah, we just have one microphone, so you have to um, swap right. back. And yeah, um, so does anyone know about the Cortex, about uh, all the ARM stuff and, and um, how that all belongs together? So we'll shortly explain. This is uh, a Cortex-M3, which is uh, a sort of architecture. Um, 
And um, uh, well, it's, it's, it's basically it's simple. It has uh, a few transistors. It's, it's, uh, and in comparison to that, it's, really, it's a really powerful thing. Um, and maybe just, uh, go on to the, to the next one. Um, I came across this processor uh, in, a, in a small development kit. There are thousands of different develop kits out there using different sorts of processors for this. Um, this is the STM32 Circle. Uh, it uses a Cortex-M3 made by ST, uh, um, ST Micro. Uh, and it has quite a couple of, of peripherals in. It has a small display, has some sort of, of uh, gravity sensors in it. And it's, it's, it's a nice thing to play with. That was my first, uh, well, first access to that sort of family. We came across, and, but then um, when you dig into it, you see ARM does not do silicon. Um, so they don't build ARM, it's unlike um, Atmel, or uh, it's not a manufacturer of chips. They do reference designs and they, they build a, bob, a sort of blueprint of the, of the processor core and give it to other manufacturers to build their own chips. And that's, um, well, for example, this is just a small collection of, of companies that do Cortex uh, and ARM designs. Um, there are about 20 or 30 different ones, and there's a huge variety of it. Do you want to? Yeah, and, uh, uh, basically this is towards the open hardware thing. Um, in a way, there, there are really no open cores, um, but this does give you a lot of uh, choice because you're, you're, not, if you're, you're not stuck with Atmel. You're stuck with any number of different um, um, silicon manufacturers, um, and they, they have a comparable architecture in, in all of theirs. Yeah. So if you, if you look at the Omega, um, you have sort of 200 different things. That's what the Arduino uses. If you look at Cortex-M3, you have 20 manufacturers. You have different series of processors inside that. So you're looking at about 10,000 different varieties of chips that you can choose from. If you, if you, so if you want some, some nice I.O., if you want some uh, low, uh, low, ma low power consumption, or if you want radio, Military whatever. Grade, uh, uh, whatever, waterproof, uh, whatever. Um, so the next board, so, so when, you, when you play with a circle, it's, it's sort of limited. This is a nice toy, but you, you cannot really do really much with it. Um, and so the next thing I came across um, is um, uh, the call LPC Expresso. It's another prototyping board, uh, which is quite nice. It's really cheap, um, and it uses exactly the same processor that we have, that we have here. Um, it's a nice board. Um, uh, it, it contains a target board, which has, has the processor on it, so you can, you can play your, your stuff. And the other half is a programmer, actually, which has a processor that is 10 times as powerful, but it doesn't really matter. Um, and the funny thing is you can program and debug with it, and once you're done, you take a saw and cut the board into halves, and you can just use the one part, the target part, and you throw away the debugger or use it for something else, which is quite a nice thing, and it comes with an Eclipse-based IDE, which is not so nice. Um, it's, it's, it's a pain somewhere. But it's fully featured, and if it's, you need a yeah. professional debugger, then yeah, but then um, um, sort of um, I run a different company, Gordmutgrad, um, uh, and we build some these, these rotating tables where you can make those 360 degree photographs. Um, and at that point, you, you say, okay, I cannot use simply a development board anymore. I, I need to make my own PCB and, and have to design it on my own. Um, and it actually turned out that it was as difficult as it seems if you have some basic knowledge about electronics and are willing to spend some time into it. Uh, so that has a custom board, and that's how we got started with it and say, okay, it's not that difficult, so if you have done your first board, it's easy to do your second. Um, that's basically it about that. Yeah, you have to think, um, uh, just a second. Uh, uh, so Cortex, uh, the, the ARM Cortex, there are three different varieties, Cortex-A, Cortex-R, Cortex-M, those are three different series, and there are different cores in that, so, so uh, ARM itself, is, is there another slide? Or no, no it's, it's, it's gone, okay. I, I was looking for this slide. Um, so they have about 20 different varieties of chips, so for example, the Cortex-A, it's, it's in the smartphones, and the Cortex-M is the, the low end, which is for microcontrolling. Um, and the M3, is, so it's, it's one variant, and um, LPC is one manufacturer of that, and they have three different series of Cortex-M3, and within each series, you see, this is just a small collection from their list, so there are hundreds. Um, and basically, we chose this one uh, because, uh, well, it's, it's relatively powerful. Um, it's, it's, it's cheap. Uh, you can easily spend 20 euros for, for a microcontroller. This is cheaper. Um, it's about, if you, if you buy that at thousands, they're two euros a piece. So that's not that 
not that bad. If, if you buy one, they're four. Right. Yeah, right, right. So it's, 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 you can afford it. Um, uh, they have USB on board, and they have this really nice feature. It's like you solder this board, and if, you, if you've done it correctly, you just connect it to your computer and it will say, hey, I'm a drive. That's, that's cool. You don't need to do anything, and, and you can start with it. Um, yeah, and it is, has some, some nice features that the Arduinos don't have. So, for example, they, they don't only have pull-ups. They also have pull-downs, and they can do hardware division, something like that. Those are features that um, shouldn't c care too much about it, but the Arduino and people, whoever knows that will, will know, uh, okay, that's a nice thing to have because if you don't have it, you will miss it. Um, that's basically how we came to that processor. And also, yeah. take this one. Also, it already has a, it has a, um, uh, Philips um, has, a, has a fairly large SDK for it, so it's, so it's fairly feature complete in that. Um, with this Eclipse-based thing, but there's also other projects that already have a, have a complete software, um, software environment um, to work with it. Um, basically, we, we, we bootstrap this design off of the design for the, for the multi-rotating table thing. Um, and actually, this, um, and it, it was sort of bootstrapped off of itself because the first, uh, the first PCB we did uh, was done with a sort of homemade improvised CNC mill um, that we used to mill, uh, you know, this 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 PCB design. Um, yeah, that was made in my living room. Yep. And and the mill was actually controlled by this thing as well. Um, so basically, now we have all of these components here and put together. And what we want to sort of explain to you now is, is you start off with this with this processor and how do you come up with this design and how do you put everything together. Um, so basically, you 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 look at the instruction manual. Um, where you end up uh, finding this, 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 this pinout of the chip, which, which tells you what all the little feet mean, and then you have to start figuring out. Short, short remark, if you come from the software area, look into those hardware manuals. They're amazing, they're, they're so good. It's, it's amazing how they, how, how they couldn't put it together. Everything is correct, everything is complete. They have nice sentences, it's, it's great to, to see that. So the hardware business, they really know how to do documents. It's, it's amazing. That was just a side note. So, so basically, we're going to go through the entire design and explain what everything is and how, and how we came above it. So we're going to start with the generous built-in peripherals, uh, which in our case is, is uh, there's, there's, there's an LED on here and, and a button. Uh, so basically, those are the two parts for the LED and the button. Um, and we're just going to go through and, and keep marking off the, the pins that we've already co connected. Um, this from the schematic. This is the uh, this is the button. There's one pin on part one, pin four, which just contains the button and and, and connects that to the ground. And there's a, uh, there's an LED connected, which uh, needs a uh, the current restricting a well, resistor that uh, yeah a current limiting resistor so that the LED doesn't burn through. Uh, and one of the things that um, I think is always skipped across. You either know why that's there or why not, um, and we wanted to sort of go through the example of how to how to come up with that resistor and and, and why we put that resistor there. Okay, I, I should do that. Yeah, okay, okay. Do that. I'm the I'm the I'm high, smart hardware one. guy. Um, so you start off uh, looking at your LED and you look at the data sheet and you say it says okay um, this LED should be run typically at 20 milliamperes. Um, that's the first red circle. Um, um, LEDs are typically uh, current controlled, not voltage controlled. If you, if you put a uh, voltage to a, to a, a, a LED, it will either not light up or it will just burn through. So do that by, by, um, by uh, uh, current. Um, and you have another thing that's also the, uh, the, the data sheet you see at 20 milliamps. Um, the voltage drop is typically two volts. Um, so the LED uses two. Takes yeah, it's, well, when, when you run it with 20 milliamperes, there are typically two, two volts if you measure both sides at it. That's about two volts. And we're using, that the, that's the trick, we're using Ohm's law to convert voltage and, and current. Um, now, um, we're using a special pin for the LED. Um, that's uh, a, per, uh, a pin that can uh, drive uh, quite a high um, current. Um, that's the high current um, output pin. And you have this sort of graph, and now you look at, um, okay, what's the voltage if you, if you put 20 milliamps, if you pull 20 milliamps out of the pin, uh, how much will be the voltage? So if you, if, you cur uh, if you pull really 
lots of current, it, the voltage will go down. Um, and now you look, and, and the middle line that you see uh, is at 25 degrees uh, Celsius, um, and that's, and you, you can see at the diagram, it's about three volts. So we had three volts and two volts, and so there's, uh, well, it's about one volt that's over, that's, that's too much, and so, so there needs to be, if you put those two in series, there needs to be one volt at the resistor. And now that's Ohm's law, that's really cool. Um, you want to know the resistance, we have one volt, we have 20 milliamps, and you come up with resulting resistance of 50 ohms. That's the main calculation, it's really simple. Um, we didn't put in 50, 50 ohms because we, we don't want to go to the limits of the specification, you don't want to burn these things, and, and there are different LEDs that have different voltage drops, and just to be safe, we say, okay, we run it at half the power that's possible, so we take 100 ohms, which is, by, by the way, uh, a standard component to get. Um, that's how to get that figure. Software. No, 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 no. Here's a, you're the software guy. You have to guy. do the right LED. <laughs> uh, so, so basically, how does this look like af afterwards in, uh, in in software to 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 actually uh, to, to actually turn the LED on and off again? Um, in these embedded systems, basically, this is a, a, a the memory map that you have with a, a 32 bit system. It goes from from up to up to four gigabyte. Obviously, these systems have very little memory. Uh, this one has eight kilobytes of memory. So there's a lot of room in the memory map to, to, to map other functionality in it. Um, right at the bottom where it's cut off, um, the bottom part is the ROM. Then there's a, a, a small memory segment for the RAM. There's 16K for the, the, the mass storage device bootloader in there. Uh, there are some peripherals. That's the APB, the advanced peripheral bus. But we're using hardware peripherals, so those are on the advanced hardware bus. So this is basically the, uh, the memory uh, range between uh, 50,000 hex um, and above. There are, there are four I.O. ports. Each of those contain 12 pins, 12 physical pins on the processor. Um, and, each, and the ports are just a subdivision of, for, for these pins. So uh, each of those ports has controls for four, four of the pins. And by the way, there's no operating system. You just control everything by reading those memory addresses and writing to those memory addresses, which is really cool. Yeah. There's nothing in between you have full control over They're just, uh, in, in the code, they're just C pointers, basically. Um, so in, in our case, for the, from the schematics, from the, from the LED, um, we can see that we're on port zero, we're the seventh pin within that. Um, so we can see the, uh, the control for port zero starts at 50,000, no, five million? Um, and in that, in that range of memory, there is um, the data structure that's described in the, in the, uh, in the data sheet. And um, each of these addresses within there have different, uh, different meanings, like the GPIO data, that's actually, uh, or, or first of all, you set the direction, whether you want to write to this pin or read from this pin. And uh, once you've configured the pin, uh, you can write and read to GPIO data. The, the other things aren't, aren't, aren't that important at the moment. Um, so what you end up doing in the, um, in the SDK is that you write set the direction and write to the output. But that's already fairly, fairly, um, fairly abstracted away. We, we do have the pin and the port in here, and, and, and we give those to these, to these functions that we wrote in our, in our SDK. And to set the direction, basically what happens is, um, depending on, on which direction we want, if we want to read or we want to write, uh, we either clear the pin or uh, we either clear that one bit in the direction structure, or we uh, set that bit in the direction structure. So now basically the question is, what is this GPIO um, port thing? This is just a large C struct that um, defines an array that starts at 5,000, which is from, from the data sheet, that's that memory instruction. Um, it has this, this dir field in the struct. And basically this struct just one to one mirrors this, uh, this memory region that, that, you can, that you write to to control the pin. Um, 
the write output basically does the same thing. I think we should probably make it short. Yeah. Skip it and go there's to the a, next there's one. There's another feature that allows you to, to set certain bits and stuff like that, but it's basically it's just calculating the address Square. and writing its data to it. That's it. So power supply. Yeah. Next part. Oh, hardware should we uh, should we show the the what? Where we are on the hardware? Yeah. So we started um, off with the peripherals. You can see over here. This is the button, and this is the uh, these are the LEDs. Um, and we're going over to the power supply, which is up here. And no peripherals and the. De Coupling devices, which are right yep. here, and explaining those next. Okay, uh, basically we get our power from USB. Um, you can put other in, uh, other power supplies, but basically uh, if you plug it in, it should work. So uh, USB gives you five volts. Unfortunately, the processor runs at three point three volts. So you need to uh, well some sort of uh, uh, controlled uh, well, getting that down to to uh, to the to the right voltage. And what you basically use is there are integrated power re uh, voltage regulators. It's a small chip that will regulate it down. And there are different uh, varieties, and the, the most simple ones are called LDOs. And this is an uh, excerpt from DigiKey, which is a large supplier for components. And uh, you see it's, it's 37,000 different uh, uh, models that you can get. So you quite have a choice. Um, and you can just, just go there and print out all data sheets. Um, but you can, there's, there's a nice way to search for it. Um, and basically, what you, what you, there are different characteristics, what you need to do. Uh, of course, the, um, it, it should be small for, for, for the chip, uh, for, for our board. Um, uh, it must be able to, to derive 3.3 volts, not from 5 volts, but from about 4.5 volts. Because USB spec says it's 5 volts, but it might be less. It's just, it's, it's just some voltage, and you need to be able to do that. Um, and you need some external components, you need to, to check that. And you might also want to maybe connect it to a nine volt battery, so you might want to go beyond the five volts as well. Right, so, so it needs right. So you have to go through all of, of these. There are some, some main characteristics. And basically, uh, don't take a very special exotic component because it's really likely that you cannot get it after a year anymore. Um, we chose the MCP1801, which is one of those devices small and cheap and, and does everything we want to do. And this is actually from the data sheet and says, okay, you need to put a capacitor at the, at the uh, entry and at the exit, so at the high voltage side and the low voltage side. So and that's are, exactly that. This is, the, uh, this is the actual voltage regulator and these are the two capacitors that go on. Right. And in the, in the data sheet, there's, there's an exact specification what sort of capacitors you should take. Um, second thing is, um, now we have 3.3 volts, um, and as a rule of thumb, is in in nowadays digital world, don't just connect the power, but put a decoupling comp a capacitor next to each single power supply pin that you have. Um, that's something that that's not written in the specification explicitly. That's something you need to know somehow. Um, uh, at those high frequencies, but, but this, this uh, processor, that's 72 megahertz. It's, it's in comparison to, to the gigahertz of, of PCs, it's not that much, but it's still quite a frequency. Um, at these frequencies, all those traces and all the lines and all the, all the routes that you have on your board become not only wires, but they're capacitors and inductors, so, so they, they have an inductance and, and they do everything, uh, every sort of, of funny behavior. And the capacitor is there to eliminate the, uh, uh, um, uh, those those effects. So uh, if, if you switch the current, for example, there will be, if it's an inductance, so um, it will cause high voltage spikes. And you, you put that sort of a, of a small buffer next to each consumer, which is a sort of, of a small small miniature power supply, which just e paves out everything. Um, and there's a rule of thumb that, that you well, take 100 nanos for everything. That's uh, there's there's a high. You can you can do, go into detail and simulate that. But as a rule of thumb, taking 100 nanos is a good thing to do. And just take it and forget about that, and, and unless you have a uh, uh, run into problems with it. And so that's exactly what we do. Uh, we have 100 nanos. Uh, we have two of them because the chip has two different power supplies. One is for the core, and one is for the peripherals. Um, that's basically it. Um, Yeah, basically, well, or 
To say, to say it in other words, when, 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 you're, when you keep drawing in, at 72 two megahertz and you, you, you keep sort of drawing a little bit more electricity when you're working and, and back and forth, the, the power supply wires keep getting uh, electricity pumped back and forth and they turn into a little, broadcast, a little broadcaster. Um, so if you don't have these decoupling capacitors, what will happen is that you'll be broadcasting a 72 megahertz um, uh, um, signal out. Uh, into the world and uh, disturbing all sorts of other electronic devices in the neighborhood. And basically these, uh, these capacitors um, absorb the, the, the quick pulling and pushing of electricity that, that's, that's coming out of the chip, just to stabilize things and to not annoy your neighbors. That's the, the reason to, to have them. Put capacitors everywhere. That's <laughs> it's always good. So how do you get the 72 megahertz? That's the next question. Ah, yeah, yeah. Um, oscillator. Um, basically, uh, you don't need an oscillator. So you can, you can run this chip just by taking a, a 3 volts battery and attaching that to the power supply and it will start if there's a program on it. Um, but, uh, and it has an internal oscillator. And you can derive, that's also one of the nice things of the Cortex architecture, you don't need to specify that in your hardware how fast the chip will run. Um, it's just a base frequency and you can, you can configure that to run, so uh, we're deriving internally, we're, we're deriving 72 megahertz from the 12 megahertz oscillator. Um, or you could run, say, I, I want to run at 36 or at some multiples, so you can tune that up and down. Just, that's really nice. Um, why is it needed? Um, USB has very strict timing requirements. So, so USB says your frequency, your timing must be very precise and there's no uh, internal oscillator in a chip that can meet those requirements. So uh, each time you have a microcontroller and want it connected to USB, you need an external oscillator that will be precise. Um, how do you do it? You look and into the great data sheet. Did I mention that they're good? Um, uh, and you look up, uh, okay, I want to have a 12 megahertz oscillator, uh, and it says, okay, you need to have something with an internal resistance of this, and you need what? And you need some sort of, of load capacitors, and you need that sort of load capacitor. So it's all in the table, you just look it up and put it into your circuit, yep. right? And there's, there's nothing, that you cannot do really much about this. Um, that's what the engineers there found out, and it's just a requirement to do it like that. Right? Well, and, and, and these capacitors, again, you're pushing electricity back and forth. The, the, the quartz crystal that you're putting inside is sort of a pendulum, and it gets electricity pushed back and forth, and the capacitors are on the each side of it to, to absorb the electricity and send it back and to keep the signal going. And this was basically, how do you know what sort of capacitors you put there? Well, you look in the data sheet. Um, the question is, how do we know we're, we're in this column of the, uh, of, of the data sheet? Why do we need 12 uh, megahertz? Uh, and actually, this is, these are the, the XTEL, the, the pins that we connect them to. Um, and here are the, the, the 12 megahertz and the two 18 picofarad um, capacitors that we connect to them. And the reason for picking 12 uh, megahertz is, is, is fairly simple. USB needs a very, very stable um, uh, frequency to operate on, and it needs precisely 48 megahertz. So with 12, with, a, with, a multi with an internal multiplier, you can, you can, you can evenly get to uh, 48 megahertz for the US, that's required for the USB. And if you, uh, the, the, the chip is able to multiply the, the input crystal frequency by 12 for its own um, 72 megahertz operating uh, frequency. So we're at the USB um, part now, and uh, that's sort of the most difficult part or the, the part that also has the most, um, um, most uh, possible error uh, in it. Yeah. Um, the USB, just for reference, obviously is over here, and it contains one um, 10 kilo ohm resistor that goes up here. This is a, a transistor that we'll, we'll explain, explain a little bit, and two 33 volt um, uh, terminating uh, resistors. Um, so that would be this part of the design, just to keep you on board. By the way, uh, I let me go, go, go through it. Uh, one of the lessons learned is um, we thought, oh, micro USB, that's cool. Everyone has micro USB and it's small and it's, it's cool and fancy. Um, if you have the space and do your own design, don't do it. They're really tiny and they're, they're hell for soldering. It's, 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 it's terrible. 
So that's the component that is most difficult to solder. Even the chip is easier. Um, I hate it. And it's, by the way, it's the last component we solder, and on, on, we've, we've had two people, uh, well, destroying their boards while soldering that on after all the work that was done, which is terrible. Well, basically, um, how does USB work? Um, it's a complete physical uh, uh, transceiver inside the chip. About this, um, what you need is um, you see the two horizontal blocks, which is uh, those are terminating resistances, uh, resistors. Uh, they are needed if you have a high frequency signal. You need termination at the end so that will block reflections within the cable or something you need that for for a stable uh, signal and that's huh ethernet. yeah for example if you know the ethernet the old ethernet terminators um, that's just for to keep the, ref the the signal from reflecting off the wire back and forth um, that's basically what you do and you those termination resistances at all sorts of data lines um, and that's something that is there and uh, well if you want to know the value well, look in the data sheet. Um, in addition, that the more, more interesting, basically, uh, and, uh, the interesting part is this 1.4 kilo, uh, 1.5 kilo resistor, <coughs> which is needed for USB um, to detect if there's a device plugged in. So, uh, if you plug in a device, how should the how should the host, the computer, know if there's a new device and what sort of device is there? They just see, oh, uh, there's a small resistance pulling. And if that's there, they, they will know. Uh, and by the way, this will also tell the hmm? um, if it's a low-speed device, you would take the, the, the other line and pull it up. So you, it depends on where you put that. So the last, no, the last component, MOSFET. Well, uh, no, uh, this huh? is where, so these are the pins, just to mark those off. Yeah. Um, ah, yeah, yeah, go, go on to that. And the, you can see this is the way it looks in the data sheet. This is the way how we do it, and it's exactly the same. Surprise. Different. Yeah, it's, it's well, yeah. Um, but the weather well, transistor is, is a nice thing uh, because you can turn it on and off, and the, the device can well connect and disconnect itself from the bus. Okay. Uh, last, it's, it's about the last component that we have, right? Mm, yeah, the flash, the SBI. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Um, last thing that we need to do is there's a reset pin, and we may need to make sure that the, the device actually starts, um, which means we have to tie up the reset pin. So it will not reset the, com the, the processor, so, but say, okay, now you can go. Um, and you need a second one. Um, there's a small contact on here. You can, it's, it's quite small, but uh, if you can see it. Yeah. Um, at the left side. And if you connect those two contacts, um, the device will go into programming mode when it connected to USB again. So imagine you have program running on it. If you plug it in, your program will start. You want to put another program on top of it uh, or replace that, so you just connect those two pins and plug it in, and so it will, will again be a mass storage device, so, so you can put something new on. Um, and we basically put two uh, pull-up resistors there. At, at those pins, there's, there's one of the pins is the programming pin, and the other pin is the uh, reset pin. And um, basically, we pull them up with an external resistor, because you cannot do that with the internal ones, because it's, uh, you need to have pulled that up before you even have access to your program. So you need to do it in hardware. Uh, and the, 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 the big red side, uh, the red thing at the side, is the, the contact that you can connect to ground uh, to pull down the thing so you can distinguish is it programming mode or is it your application mode, right? So um, in, in, in other words, basically, there's, there's, there's two things the processor needs to see, or, or there's one thing that the processor needs to see when it starts. Do I start the program that you programmed onto the, um, the processor, that you copied onto it, the firmware, or do I start the program that I have built in, and that program does nothing but uh, turn it into a USB stick so that you can copy your own program on it? And it determines whether to run your program or its ROM program for the, for the mass storage device by checking on the pin 01 to see if it's connected, uh, if, it's, high or low. if it's high or low. If it's high, you will just, it will just run the program that is on your uh, computer. And if you basically short out these these two little pads, you will connect it to ground, and then it will be low, and then it will say, I don't care about your program anymore, I'm gonna start the mass storage driver again so that you can put a new program on it. 
um, the reset. And Arduinos have an actual button that, that, that will activate this reset. That's basically while the computer is running to just say, it's basically to reboot the, the computer, just start over again. Um, we don't see any, you can just sort of pull the electricity off and do that as well, so, so we didn't actually uh, waste a physical button on, on, having to res on, on having a reset. It's always pulled to high, we never want it, to, want it on ground so that the computer restarts itself. Okay, uh, Okay. Um, there's a last component that is not, um, there's, there's one empty space and uh, in case um, this, this thing has 32 kilobytes of RAM, uh, of flash. Um, so for program and data. Um, and in case you want more, there's a nice thing. You can just buy a, a cheap serial flash chips and you can just solder them on top and they will talk. Uh, the, so the processor and the chip will talk through a serial, pros, a serial pr uh, protocol called SPI, um, uh, which basically has four data lines. And that's basically what we do. We connect those four data lines one is uh, the clock, one is data in, one is data out, and one is used to select the chip. That's it. Um, so uh, that's basically the circuit, and you just connect one to, in, to another. By the way, um, uh, I, I said you should have a capacitor for, for all of power supplies. I didn't do that at that point, so I violated my own rule. But if you can see it on, on the circuit, you can see that it's really, really, really close to the power supply, so there's no line that can cause trouble. And I, I could save a uh, device, uh, uh, yeah, another component which makes the device smaller. Yeah. Um, so basically, if that's something we want to give you home, if you want to build your own things, if you think, okay, if, if those two guys can, can build a uh, PCB and build their own computer, I can uh, as well. Um, yeah, we want to encourage you. It's, very, it's, it's easier than you think. Um, and so if there's something we can give as general rules of thumb is, uh, first is uh, look at the data sheets. They're really, so, so they, they, they're not even boring. They're interesting to read um, and they're, they're good. And, and uh, even the manufacturers have nice guides. They have full books with, with cookbooks, with, uh, with circuits, with how, how to do things. And what's, if they're really nice. They're trying to help you. They're, they're really, uh, they want to sell, of course they want to sell their products, but in order to do that, they help you in, in designing. So they're really worth reading. And um, second thing is, um, so DigiKey is just an example. It's one of the, of the major uh, uh, distributors for, for components. But look in there and see what's the variety and what, what different categories do they have. So what's the, well, what's the wealth of different choices? Uh, uh, what are the components? And if you, if you uh, well, if you don't understand something, you go over to Wikipedia and try to look it up there. And then it will give you back, and then you go to back to DigiKey Digi and um, see something. And this is sort of a loop, uh, and at the end of the loop, you will understand what that means, which is uh, pretty cool. And uh, the third thing is look at other people's designs. So man, nowadays, it's, it's really nice, um, even hardware guys starting to open up their designs. So there's a lot of open circuits in the net, and it's really interesting to see what other people did. So most of the dev boards have their open schematics there, and they're not all, perf all perfect, but if you see that all other people are doing the same way, there might be a reason why they do it. Um, and even if something was bad, you, you can see something as a bad example. Uh, so that's interesting to see, um, and when you do that, it's, it's simple to do these things. So thank you. Yeah. And it's also, we've, we've, we've not done this talk in front of a big audience before, we've always done it in, 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 in workshops, and it, uh, I think it's become obvious that I think it's a lot less confusing when you're actually um, putting the thing together and have it in your hand and, and, and are able to play around with the components. So this is just basically as an invitation. We are, um, we're at the Raum Zeit Labor people uh, today and tomorrow, and if you actually want to try yourself at putting one of these together, um, and, and, and sort of to, to make this a little bit more plastic and to actually um, figure out what all of this means that we just explained to you, you can come by and we have enough kits to, to, to put your own together. And with that, it is a, our only German slide. Thank you and for your attention. And if you, in case you guys have any questions, um, feel free to ask them in the round. Uh, we will repeat them and, uh, in German or in English. And... Um, Try to find or, or, you know, um, come to come to the stand and, and talk to us and have a look. So, anybody have any questions?
in, at Arduino, there's a self-healing fuse. Yeah. Um, Do you know what a self-healing fuse is? Yeah, it's, it's a few, well, it's, it's, a, it's a protection mechanism that can, if, if, if there's some sort of overcurrent or undercurrent, and you know, overcurrent, it will, um, it will just uh, disconnect and protect your circuit, and um, uh, once the condition is gone and everything has cooled down, uh, it will start again. Um, well, first of all, this is, um, it's sort of inspired um, by a minimum design. Uh, it's like, it's like there, there shouldn't be anything unnecessary on the board. And um, it's a nice thing to have protection fuses on there. Uh, on the other hand, if you build it yourself, um, it's, it's, a, it's easy to, to destroy it in, in any way. There, there are a thousand different ways of destroying the board. And this will eliminate one of them, which is quite a nice thing. Uh, on the other hand, you cannot make it safe anyway. So this is meant to be a, a, a board how industry would do it. Like, um, and they wouldn't do a fuse in there. If it's, con if it's closed, um, they would save each and every component. Um, yeah, you could put it in. But if you like it, uh, well, just take, just take the schematics and add the fuse. That's, that's the nice thing about, hey, do it yourself. It's just a proposition of, of very, very simple, minimalistic, uh, uh, no, no additional components. There, there, there can be other protections on, on there. Uh, we said, okay, this is the, the sort of minimum to get something working and, and nothing extra. Do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, I, I assume that the software you use to do the schematics and also the layout is Google Docs. Yeah, right. Uh, is there any free alternative, like say about free as in free PDF, which people use, but free software? Uh, Well, people do do designs with, I mean, you obviously know them, like OpenPCB and things like that, and people do use them to do complicated things, but Eagle is, 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 um, has a good balance of wide industry acceptance. You also want to be able to export files to make the PCB and send them to any sort of PCB manufacturer and not have to start discussing with them that you want to use OpenPCB format or have to use some sort of translation script. So, so, so it is a compromise. Um, there are, uh, there are um, open source uh, schematic and, and, and PCB layout tools. Um, but yeah, everybody just kind of uses Eagle. Yeah. Well, for the first board, I, I used some, some self-built scripts in order to, do, to run the mill because it's all sort of well, self-made scripting thingies and there was uh, maybe I did, did some sketching in Eagle, but, but most of the board was done with, with its own sort. But in the end, you need some Eagle, for, uh, Eagle files or GABA files or something like that, and you don't want them to break. Um, and that's, mm, yeah, I, I don't know a good, uh, there, there, there are many approaches, but I don't know a good, good uh, uh, solution that is where I would say, okay, it's, 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 it's ready enough for really doing productivity. So it's, it's sort of a bit painful. But maybe, no, maybe that will change. Any what? Experience. experience. Do we have any experience with alternative uh, 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 yes, um, firmware? Yeah, Toolchain. Tool chain, yeah. Uh, the, the script yeah. There's there's a, there's a number of um, tool chains. Um, there there are several co commercial ones. Uh, Kaya is I think what 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 Philips suggests um, you use. Um, what we're using and, and what most people are using, uh, the, what, what we showed the GitHub uh, thing for was, was more of the SDK that, that uh, uh, similar to what we showed the examples to that, that allow you to actually write the programs. Let's see. Um, and most people use a GCC for ARM. Um, and, and there's several uh, ARM uh, GCC tool chains that exist that you can use. And we're currently playing around um, LLVM C, uh, has, a, has a CLang variant and they can, they can also emit um, thumb code, which is again, one of those ARM, you know, ARM code and thumb code. Um, and, and so CLang can, can actually um, uh, compile, compile, the, uh, compile the firmware. So there, there would be two different compilers and for the ARM compilers, there's, there's lots of different distributions that actually, um, that, that actually provide the, the, GCC, um, the GCC compiler tool train. But the GCC one is the one that's the most stable and that almost everybody yeah, uses. It works nicely, it's, it's, it's nice. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 
Okay, so the question was the 1343, there's, there's a 17 series. Okay, the 1343 is that the 1343 is the most powerful M3 from an XP uh, that they have. Um, so, so no, there's, there's a 17 series that's, that's quite a lot more powerful and that also have uh, more powerful peripherals that have uh, Ethernet on board, for example, that you, that you could hook up Ethernet directly to it. The, they are they are similarly easy to adapt, and for example, the uh, or the less powerful ones are very often pin identical. Even you could you could use the sport to put them in. The more powerful ones are quite similar, but the big drawback is they don't have this USB mass storage firmware. So you would actually need an external programmer to to program those. But the, from the, from the design, they would be. Um, I mean, if, if, if you're building a reference design where you actually need Ethernet and things like that, you're, you're sort of more sophisticated anyway, and you'll probably have some sort of programmer um, uh, to deal with. But the schematics, uh, so the schematics for the larger ones would be about the same. It would be, I, I don't think if there's a, no, it would be, I, I, would, I would think it's, it's almost exactly the same. If you want Ethernet, of course you need to put on the Ethernet jack and some resistors and some stuff, sure. Um, First was the reason that, that bootstrapping with this, with this one is really easy, um, which is nice. Um, and the second reason is that this is relatively small. It just has 48 pins, which is easy to solder. Um, if you have these uh, well, BGA uh, things, they, 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 it's not simple to do that by hand anymore. Um, but um, so if, if you want at the, uh, which is QF, this, is, this package type is called QFP, and if you want to stay in that range, um, yeah, you have the 1700s, you have the 1800s, and you have the, the other manufacturers, and they go up to, and they even have, you can go to the, the, to the 4300, which is a Cortex M4, M0, dual core, whatever thing, uh, which goes up to 400 megahertz and has a Mac of RAM uh, and, and stuff like that, so re they're really powerful. Um, and that's the nice thing about, and they all have the same code, they all have the thumb code, and they, have the, they share most of their architecture, so it's easy to migrate if, if you need more power. But are there 1700s with the same pin that are pin compatible? No, they're, they're AQFP64. But you, so you cannot take exactly that board, but you would have to change the pins for that. But it's, it's, um, the schematics is the same. You just need to well, put some larger footprints in and yeah. connect them. Yeah. You, what software, uh, what license applies to this software? Yeah. Um, that's a nice question. Um, because, okay, first of all, there's, there's a, um, in ROM, there's a mass storage uh, uh, driver built in in ROM, and there's an HID driver in ROM. Uh, and there, by the way, there are newer ones, uh, the, the 1347, which is almost pin compatible, uh, and they have also audio and stuff like that. Um, if you take them, it's, it's fine, They're because that's in ROM and that's, you take the license, uh, it's, 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 uh, you, you're free to, free to use it through for whatever you want. Um, concerning other software USB stacks, that's difficult, because even the microbuilder, the open source one, uses um, uh, the software stack by Kyle, and you still have that in the header in, and they say, um, well, this is just as an example, and you're not supposed to use it for anything. And that's the reason why we're currently building our own thing, which we will give uh, uh, completely open source. And it's, it's, it's not completely done, or our firmware is not completely done, but I expect it to be done in the next weeks. Uh, so you get some software uh, USB stack, um, which is open, and I, I don't know the license that we will use, but it will be one of the freely open ones. Yeah. But, but the software that comes with the micro builder code and the example, and, and, the, and the Eclipse based stuff, um, that does have working um, USB. So, um, Depending on your uses and, and how open source you want to be, there are um, there are things that you could use immediately that are that are feature complete. Yeah, and it's just the license is a bit strange for, for it. You're right. Okay. So okay. Uh, well, concerning the hands-on offering, uh, do you have a dashboard version of this for some more oh. experimenting after the bottom of the LED? Well, yeah. The there's the Contacts on the bottom, and you could you could make your own uh, breadboard version. <laughs> oh no no no. Okay, well, well um, just 
this, this design is breadboard won't work because there, there are no through hole um, versions of the chip. Um, and, but once this is finished, you can, you can, you can uh, connect this. This has the same pitch as, as the old IDE cables, so you can, just, you can just solder an IDE cable to it and then use that for, for breadboarding if, if, if that's way, what you want to there's do. There's one, one more thing that lessons learned. At those frequencies, don't use breadboards anymore. At, at 70, so so at, at high frequencies above 10 megahertz, they probably will, your circuits will probably not work anymore. So it's it's nice for well putting an LED and having some resistors and some nice I/O. That's that's nice at low frequencies, yes. But in in these things, it, it's a really it, it makes a difference how you have your path through the through the uh, 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 through the PCB and how the routing is, how long the wires are. They will all cross talk and they will do, all do really funny things. Um, and something, no, don't do it with a breadboard anymore. So not the board itself, but it's easy to attach to your breadboard, the, the IOs to a breadboard, and then you can do your IO parts uh, on a breadboard. That works. And the other thing, um, I assume you have some of the, the PCBs for soldering available, but how do you get them in practice? Do you have any, any upgrades from the PCB manufacturer to get those? Um, th so the question was how we, how we get our PCBs, right? Especially for this hand -on stuff. Um, basically, well, we, I, uh, first iterations I did them, as, as you saw, with a, with a mill and I do, did them with toner transfer. You can etch them yourselves at, at simple versions. Um, and at some point we said, okay, the design is good enough now uh, and we go to a manufacturer. And basically uh, we looked through the German ones. There's a lots of, of small side prototyping uh, facilities where you can just uh, send in your designs and get something back. Uh, and actually, we, we wanted to try that out and, and made this, uh, we sent it uh, to China. And that was a really, um, say, uh, interesting, interesting experience, experience yeah. Um, it's like, uh, uh, it, it took weeks and they had a really nice um, sort of pragmatic um, progress monitor on your orders. Um, they had, a, had an online spreadsheet where there were all orders for, from all customers and you could just look in and they had some comments next to it. It's, it if it was sent, it's, it's, uh, it's like, you have the edit grid there? No, it doesn't work. Um, so that was really funny and it came in a really uh, funny bagging and uh, uh, we, did, we told them do it express and they didn't make it and we said send it express and they didn't do it but they had a really nicely done envelope so handwritten on it and it's, it's nice. And it was cheap and it was fine and it was okay. Um, so it's just looking around, and it's not that expensive if you, so don't do one. But uh, if you say, okay, do a couple of boards, it's not that expensive anymore. And so th that's what, that would be the split. So, so do, for prototyping, do it, try to find a uh, way on your own. Yeah, that's, that's basically it. So you can also see other people's uh, statuses. Yeah, that's the current status. So, um, yeah, and you can, you can go to the tracking numbers, and you can see where they go to. This is really funny. Um, <laughs> Yeah, maybe, maybe. That's a nice idea. That's a nice idea. All right. That's it? Okay. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot.